So as I mentioned, the topic I'm going to be discussing this evening is Israel's role in enabling Holocaust revisionism in Europe. Now, this is going to be one of those topics that is obviously a little bit controversial. Uh, Israel, from the beginning, has positioned itself as a country that is dedicated not only to the protection of world Jewry, but also to the perpetuation of the memory of European Jewry. Uh, the state of Israel's position itself is from the beginning as the heir to European Jewry. And while this is true, there's also been a tension within Israel since the beginning of the state as to how to approach relations with the countries of Central and Eastern Europe where Jewish communities were wiped out during the war. We saw this uh, in one of the most famous incidents was the controversy over receiving reparations from the Germans in the 50s. That you had, on the one side, you had Ben-Gurion saying, OK, we need money. We need support. We need arms. We need to survive. We need to accept something from the Germans. And he was right. But on the other side, you had Bacon, who was also right, who said, this is essentially blood money. We can't sell our history and self-forgiveness by accepting money. And this is one of the situations where there's no real right or wrong answer, because there's a very good argument to be made on either side, where you have to say, you know what, this is picking between two options that aren't very palatable. And really, it's, it's hard to judge one way or the other on a moral or an ethical level. And this tension between the needs of Israel's diplomacy and Israel's military alliances versus the need to protect certain ethical standards that the Jewish state uh, expressly stands for has been part and parcel of the Zionist enterprise from the beginning. And part of what we've been seeing recently is that age-old conflict coming back and obsessing the entire country uh, Israelis from across the political spectrum are discussing it. And this is all due to the recent flat with Poland. Who here is familiar with the uh, recent diplomatic spat with the Poles? OK. I see I have a very uh, well-informed audience. Uh, I'll briefly touch on the highlights of what happened, which is that in 2015, the Poles elected a new populist right-wing government. And part of the agenda that this nationalist government enacted was an attempt to push back against the previous 15 or so years worth of Polish memory policy. Since the early 2000s, Poland had become a model for how a European country could come to terms with a negative and controversial past. Uh, aside from the Germans, the Poles led Europe in confronting their demons and saying, here's what we did, here's what we could do better, here's how we'll act in the future. And Poland was held up as a model. But starting in 2015, the new nationalist government said, well, this isn't going to do. This is a disgrace to Poland. And they began enacting policies to, one, revise history, and two, to criminalize the teaching and the dissemination of accurate history. So last year, Poland passed a bill which essentially said that anyone blaming the Poles for Nazi crimes was violating Polish law and was subject to legal penalties. Now, the general interpretation of this law in the US, in Israel, and among Polish Holocaust researchers was that this is an attempt to stifle history. And one would think that Israel would say something. And they did. But what was interesting is that the Israeli government only began to respond, only began to speak out after there was a massive outcry among the populace in the media, in the newspapers, on television, on Facebook, among opposition politicians. The initial Israeli reaction, had there not been a public outcry, would have been the same as it's been for the past several years in other countries. Now, what happened in other countries, in 2015, Ukraine passed a law that was 
virtually identical in intent, if not in follow through, if not in the specific details of the law. Ukraine's law said that members of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists and the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, uh, known respectively as the UN and the UPA, were national heroes, and any veterans of these groups had to be treated like veterans of the Ukrainian Army or veterans of the Red Army. Now, the problem was that UN and UPA were virulently anti Semitic, collaborated with the Nazis, and carried out a campaign of ethnic cleansing that killed several thousand Jews and up to, depending on which, how, which historian you speak to, up to 100,000 ethnic Poles. So not exactly our kind of people, uh, I would say. So the Ukrainians said, these are our new national heroes. And Israel said nothing over, and this is symptomatic of something we've been seeing over the past decade or so. What's happened is that after the fall of communism, the European Union essentially said to these newly independent states, you want to join the EU? You want to join the West? You want to integrate with us culturally and politically and economically? You're going to have to accept certain standards. And there were economic standards, there were human rights standards, judicial standards. One of the standards was you have to accept the culture of commem Holocaust commemoration that rules in the West. In the East, prior to the end of the Cold War, during the Soviet period, any mention of the Holocaust was essentially suppressed. Holocaust victims weren't victims because they were Jews. They were Soviet citizens killed by, killed by the fascists. So the idea of having any remembrance or knowledge of the Holocaust as a unique event in human history was missing in the East. And the West essentially said, you want in? You have to accept this. You have to promote this. This has to be part of your political culture. <clears throat> and there were initial moves in that direction which helped countries like Poland and Hungary accede to the European Union. But as we saw a shift more towards right-wing populism in Central and Eastern Europe and beyond, across the entire European Union, but I'm speaking specifically in this case in the countries of the former Warsaw Pact and Soviet Union, as right-wing populism spread, you started to see this pushback against these imported Western narratives, which while being historically accurate, were considered highly offensive to the local people. And the more people within a country had engaged in collaboration or anti-Semitic behavior, the more the country would push back against it. So the Lithuanians, for example, began whitewashing Holocaust collaborators, and at one point actually tried to bring criminal charges against Holocaust survivors who had fought with pro-Russian partisan units sponsored by the Soviet Union because they were uh, war criminals who collaborated with the Soviets. And this was all part of an emergent philosophy dubbed by some observers as double genocide theory, which is the crimes of the Soviets were equal to the crimes of the Nazis. We were just as much victims as the Jews. And Jews were communists, and they got what was coming to them. To overly simplify it because of time constraints. But there's this these attempts, especially in the Baltics, to equate the Holocaust and communist crimes. We saw this in Ukraine, where the memory of the Holodomor, the uh, terror famine of the 1930s, which killed several million people, was raised to the same level as the Holocaust, where according to different, to the, there's a general consensus that up to possibly four million people died in that famine. And there's a debate among historians whether or not it was an intentional genocide. But the Ukrainian nationalists go around saying, oh, 10 million Ukrainians died. It was worse than the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So you have this kind of thinking spreading in this part of the world. And the Poles in, 20, in 2018 passed their law. And the Israelis, who were quiet in the face of uh, Lithuanian revisionism, Hungarian revisionism, uh, Ukrainian revisionism, well, they're f Netanyahu and the, his administration are forced to say something because of the public outcry. Now, this comes down to that debate in general foreign policy and in Israeli foreign policy specifically, uh, where you have to balance idealism and real politics. The idea that you have to be a pragmatist versus the idea that your foreign policy is based on concrete ideals, and on abstract ideals, I'm sorry. 
And what happened in this case was Netanyahu felt that he had to build a right-wing bloc within the EU that was more supportive of his positions on Iran and the Palestinians to counter the more critical countries in the west of Europe. Now, this was not, in and of itself, something that's particularly controversial. I mean, you ask anyone in Israel, and they're going to say, we need allies, we need friends, we need friends who are even friendlier than the friends we already have. It's not controversial in and of itself. What made it controversial was, one, many on the Israeli left objected to closer relations with countries with abysmal human rights records, with countries that are sliding towards authoritarianism and leaving behind the democratic gains that they made during the post-Cold War period. But the answer to that from the right was always, it's real politic. We don't like them. We don't like, in turn, we don't like their policy. Not that we don't like them. We don't like their policies. We don't like their human rights record. But you hold your nose and do it. Now, where this became controversial was when it came to Holocaust memory. Because rather than just ignoring things, as I've described so far, in many cases, the Israelis went so far as to praise governments that were engaged in revisionism for their policies on historical memory. Uh, so Netanyahu made public statements saying that the Lithuanians were taking great steps to protect Holocaust memory at the same time that they're naming streets after perpetrators. Uh, with the Hungarians, after the George Soros campaign where, that they had, uh, this propaganda campaign against George Soros, which whatever you think about George Soros, pro or con, do you like what he does, don't like what he does, the general consensus among Hungarian Jews was this left behind legitimate criticism and political difference, and it was, in fact, a political dog whistle. Now, while the Israelis initially criticized the Hungarians for this, they later pulled back. And you have statements, uh, I believe it was on Twitter, that uh, Netanyahu tweeted that the Hungarians are great on Holocaust memory, even though local Jewish groups, many of them, not all of them, but many of them, have been incredibly critical of their government on this issue. And in fact, one, Andras Heisler, one of the primary leaders of organized Hungarian Jewry, went so far at one point, even though he later modified the statements to express understanding of Netanyahu, he at one point actually said that he felt abandoned by the Israelis. So when 2018 rolls around, Netanyahu is forced to take strong action, and he condemns the Poles, it, the Polish government, I should say, in no uncertain terms very strong statements. And this leads to two things. One, it leads to a diplomatic rift. And two, it leads to an intense anti-Semitic backlash in the Polish media. Now, I have a friend in Warsaw who works as a anti-Semitism watchdog. He works for an organization uh, that tracks these types of incidents and works to uh, preserve Holocaust memory. And during that period, he was sending me material every day, and this was all over the Jewish media and the more general media, that the Polish media was perpetuating anti-Semitic stereotypes, running anti-Semitic material. And in fact, my friend in Warsaw was being publicly attacked in the Polish press for being a traitor, the implication being he's a tool of the Jews. So things got really bad. And the diplomatic firestorm only started to calm down when Netanyahu issued a joint statement together with the Polish prime minister, essentially laying out these are the historical facts as we can agree with them. This is our new narrative. The problem was that while he had consulted with a senior historian from Yad Vashem, the actual narrative that he was promoting was according to most Israeli scholars and most American Holocaust scholars, one that was incorrect and overstated Polish efforts to save Jews. Now, the statement was so egregious that historians at Yad Vashem actually got together and issued a statement condemning Netanyahu. Now think about this for a minute. Yad Vashem is the most non-political body in Israel. Israel is a very political society. Everything is politicized. Now, I'm a, I'm a working journalist. I tried to get uh, the, this Yad Vashem to comment on so many issues. And it's 
almost impossible to get them to comment. Every time, no comment, no comment, we don't want to speak about that, that would be inappropriate to speak about. And now, the most reticent, reserved group in Israel on these issues says, hell no, we're going to condemn our own prime minister. And they basically, and from across the political spectrum, from the left to the right, he was attacked as well. Uh, I believe that uh, Naftali Bennett, who is definitely not someone you can accuse of being uh, a left-wing critic of the right-wing government, said that Netanyahu was engaged in Holocaust revisionism. Now, that's a pretty hefty charge. Uh, but at the same time, Yehuda Bauer, who's the most senior and respected of Holocaust, uh, Holocaust scholars in Israel said the same thing in an op-ed in Haaretz. He said Netanyahu had swallowed the Polish narrative whole and was essentially <coughs> regurgitating it for the Israeli public. Now, things calmed down after that point on the diplomatic front. And for the past year, everything appeared pretty calm. But is anyone familiar with what just happened over the past few weeks? So Netanyahu was at a conference in Warsaw. And he was uh, in a rather good mood. The, their, the foreign ministry had leaked video of him in the same room talking with Arab leaders uh, with the implication, look, you know, we're being normalized. This is a big deal. And he was looking forward to getting back to Israel because there was going to be a summit meeting of the V4 group. That's uh, Poland, Hungary, uh, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia. These are four EU members from Central Europe who could serve as a counterweight to the more critical allies that Israel has in Western Europe. And for them to hold their summit for this group of nations in Israel was a diplomatic coup. Now what happens, Netanyahu starts speaking with the Hebrew press, and the Jerusalem Post, my old outlet, I used to be the diaspora correspondent there, and I have to say, first of all, before I say this, so it doesn't get interpreted as being critical of the Jerusalem Post, there was a mistake. The people of the Jerusalem Post are incredibly professional, and they are good journalists, but mistakes get made. And sometimes, if you have the bad luck that a mistake gets made at the wrong time in the wrong place, there can be repercussions. And to their credit, they fixed it immediately. But they wrote, they someone and asked him about, uh, asked Netanyahu about the whole issue of the Polish law a year later. And he said that Poles collaborated in the Holocaust, but nobody's been charged under the law criminally. Now, the article that went out was the Polish nation collaborated in, so this is collective blame for an entire nation. Now, he didn't say it, and the Post corrected it right away. Other papers also ran things that were similar. And Netanyahu scrambled to do damage control, and to his credit, he did a very decent job of it. And what happened is, in the end, the prime minister said, I'm not coming, but I'll send the foreign minister. <laughs> now, he comes back to Israel, and he appoints Israel Katz to take over as foreign minister, because until then, Netanyahu had the foreign ministry himself. He held that portfolio. So on Katz's first full day as foreign minister, what does he do? He goes on TV and says, Poles imbibe anti-Semitism with their mother's milk. Now, if you were to say Polish national, right-wing nationalism is intrinsically and in integrally bound with anti-Semitism, that would be correct. If he were to say there are issues with revisionism and anti-Semitism in contemporary Polish society, he would be correct right. to say what he said, which was a quote from Prime Minister Shamir, uh, was not very well received in Poland, to say the least. <laughs> not only did Poland pull out of the V4 summit, but the Simon Wiesenthal Center, the Simon Wiesenthal Center condemned Netanyahu. The chief rabbi of Poland condemned Netanyahu. Now, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, everybody knows they're very, very pro-Israel. And they are highly critical of European revisionism and highly critical of Poland. So if an Israeli official makes a statement so egregious that the Simon Wiesenthal Center is condemning them on behalf of Poland, and the chief rabbi of Poland is saying, we're, we're offended on behalf of all Poles, 
you know you made a mistake. Now the thinking, initially many people were thinking, you know, is he an idiot? This is what this is ridiculous, what is he thinking? But there's another interpretation, which is Israel Katz knew that elections were coming up and that Netanyahu's political days might be numbered because of pending indictments. And his, Netanyahu's policy when it comes to Eastern Europe was starting to bother many Israelis. It wasn't a top priority, but it was something that bothered Israelis, and especially the way he were, that he dealt with the polls. So Katz was essentially engaging in this kind of divisive and incendiary rhetoric for domestic political gains to say to the Likud base, no, I will stand up for your interests <clears throat> when it comes to these issues. That's another interpretation. It could be a little bit of both. But in any case, what happened was the summit fell apart. You ended up having three of the four nations coming, but it wasn't the summit. It wasn't the diplomatic coup that Netanyahu had hoped for. And we end up with a situation in which Israel, according to many Holocaust scholars, many critics, gave up on both its moral authority on these issues and lost the gains to be had from playing real politic. Now, in the course of reporting on these stories and looking at what was happening, I came across several examples of Israel engaging in this kind of politicking, not only with the Holocaust, but with other genocides as well. Now, who here has heard of the Armenian genocide? It's pretty well known. It's not, it's not a secret of history, nope. but exactly the Turks and the Armenians. Now, in Israel, it is indeed a controversial subject because every time relations with Turkey start to get on a downhill trajectory, you'll have someone get up in the Knesset and say, I have a bill to recognize the Armenian genocide. And as soon as things start to mend, you'll see the government putting pressure, no, we're not letting any such bill go for a vote. Now, more recently, there was an effort in the Knesset to pass a bill recognizing the genocide against the Yazidi in Iraq carried out by ISIS. This is pretty non-controversial. It has been recognized by a genocide by a number of countries, including, I believe, the United States. And it was, while on a much smaller scale than the Holocaust, it was the same essential occurrence. It was a group in power attempting to wipe out a minority through the use of force. And I have a colleague, Seth Ransman, who I used to work with at the Post, who covered the uh, Iraq conflict, who came back shaken, showing me pictures that he had taken from mass graves in Iraq. So I haven't been there, but I have friends who have, and I've seen their photos of the mass graves. This is genocide. But Israel refused to recognize it. Now, Seth's feeling, and what he told me, was that he feels that any recognition of that, of the Yazidi genocide as a genocide, would create pressure that the Israeli government finds unacceptable to recognize the Armenian genocide and other genocides. And in fact, Israel in other cases has allowed the pursuit of diplomatic allies to, uh, to overrule the necessity for accurate uh, remembrance. So, for instance, there was an article, uh, I believe it was last year, saying that Israel had come up with an agreement, a bilateral agreement with Myanmar, and obviously Myanmar has been involved in the Rohingya uh, massacres, and that agreement, while I don't know how it was implemented, as reported at the time in the Israeli press, included a provision which said that Myanmar had a say in how the country is presented in Israeli textbooks. Uh, Israel's also been criticized for issues of remembrance with the genocide in, I believe it was Darfur. Uh, I'd have to look again. But this is one of those questions. Now, this isn't to come out and be anti-Israel, say Israel's wrong. Israel's done a lot of good things when it comes to remembrance. 
Yad Vashem has done incredible work across the globe, and Israel has stood up for human rights. But this is one of those issues that, because it's a little bit technical, because it's a little bit involved, and because it's spread over such a wide geographic area in terms of bilateral relations with multiple countries, tends not to get attention. And when you have a country like Israel, which comes out and says, we have ideals, we are founded on ideals, and we live for these ideals, it's important that there be a public discussion of whether or not Israel is living up to these ideals, because the only way for a country, because Israel is a country like any other, it has politicians who are interested in the election, it has special interests. The only way for a country to maintain fealty to its, and loyalty to its ideals is for its citizens and supporters to say, we're going to be engaged in these issues, and we're going to be able to tell our leaders when we're unhappy. And what I think I'd like to do now, after presenting these, is open this up for questions. 